It's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak at this meeting. Here are my disclosures. So for the next 15 minutes, this is what we'll cover. I'll talk a little bit by way of introduction, why AI and imaging, look at some target applications of where AI can add value. We'll of course look at some current examples, look at the relative progress of where applications in body, that includes chest, cardiac, and abdomen, are relative to other subspecialties. We'll talk about some of the challenges and why AI applications of body have lag compared to those subspecialties. And we'll look at some of the solutions to these challenges. And of course, I'll draw a lot of my experience from my personal uh, works at the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Medical Imaging Lab, and then we'll conclude. So why AI in radiology? Well, 20 million radiology reports contain clinically significant errors. Diagnostic errors can play a role in up to 10% of deaths. Most importantly, there's a large number of people around the world that still don't have access to radiology specialists. So there's a large amount of unmet need and gap that deep learning and AI can fulfill. Well, let's go further. Why uh, AI and medical imaging? Let's use CT abdomen as an example. We know that CT use in the ED has increased over the past 10 years. There's now increasing demands for hospital systems to provide around the service care, 24-7 coverage. Diseases are more complex as our population ages and our exams are large. CT abdomens can be anywhere between 200 and 400 images. So a lot that's tasked upon us to do. If we look at some of the target areas of AI and abdominal imaging, well, they're what you would imagine. We can have segmentation tasks, classification tasks. We can look at upstream AI, outcomes, and risk prevention. And we can look at it another way. What are some of the benefits of deep learning throughout the image life cycle? And there are many that you see here. In this talk, however, I'll focus on two, which is computer-aided detection and image triage. But let's keep it simple. If you ask me, there are three practical value propositions for deep learning. First is operational efficiency. Wouldn't it be nice for an AI to come in and get rid of a stack of radiographs, majority of which are normal, so as to free up that radiologist to do more complex tasks or, dare I say, go see a patient. A second use case would be appropriate utilization of big data. We're constantly bombarded with not only medical imaging data, but clinical data, lab data, and are we really harnessing all that data to provide the most optimal care for the patient? And perhaps this is where we can leverage AI. And then finally, unlocking new image findings. We're trained in a specific way to look at an image, but there may be things on that image that might be prognostic for that patient we just don't know how to look at that image in that way. And this is where AI can come and be useful. So with those in mind, let's look at some current applications in medical imaging. And I'll start first with some of our earliest experience, which was with lower extremity radiographs. We were lucky in that at Stanford, we actually had 1.5 million studies in our PACS database that had prospective labels of normal and abnormal. So we set out to create a neural network model that would allow us to triage Lower extremity radiographs as normal or abnormal. And you can say, well, that's quite simple. Why do that? Well, it was the first, one of the first projects that we did. But beyond that, if you look in the life cycle, it actually hits two of those points, workflow triage and disease classification. So we trained a 2D convolutional neural network with about 94,000 images. We took three different models that you can see here, pre-trained them on ImageNet and Mira. Mira is actually an open data set that we released on upper extremity radiographs. And here's the results. You can see the class activation map, the two images on the top on the far right, where the model actually localizes to the distal fibular fracture. These are very important to do sanity checks for your model and to actually know what your model's looking at for interpretability. And then if you look at the AUC for all three models, they're in the point nines, which is very useful for a workflow triage algorithm. A lot of our early work, and still some of our early works now, involve chest radiographs. And this is one of them, where we took a chest next model and compared it to practicing radiologists. It was a 121 layer dense net neural network, and you can see some of the class activation maps on the right, looking at pneumonia. And when we compared the performance of this model to that of radiologists for various pathologies on chest radiographs, you can see the white bars, which is the AI model, and the red bars, the radiologists, and majority of them, the model does either as well or in some cases better than the radiologist. So here, deep learning achieves human expert performance for chest x-ray diagnosis. What about cardiac imaging? A lot of value for deep learning there. For example, we know that coronary heart uh, disease is one of the most common causes of mortalities, and risk assessment is a cornerstone for primary prevention. And as part of that, we provide coronary artery calcification. The problem with providing these quantitations of coronary artery calcium is that it requires significant resources. You have to have accredited 3D labs, specialized technologists, independent workstations. 
So we sought to automate this process. We took a ResNex 50 model, which is an encoder-decoder model, similar to the famous biomedical UNET model. The difference is that there are three skip connections from encoder to decoder at the first three layers. And we wanted to automate this process, looking at each individual coronary artery segment and quantitate the amount of calcium. And by the way, not be fooled by false positives like valvular calcification. So these are two different patients on the right, and one on the top, one on the bottom. And one column is segmentations done by human. Another column is segmentations done by the model. AI on the right, human on the left. And you can see qualitatively, they look very similar. Quantitatively, you can see that the Pearson correlation coefficient was actually quite high. And looking at the Bland-Altman plot, they're very similar. But here's the point. Here's the value prop for this model. On average, it took our uh, 3D labs two hours to turn around a coronary artery calcium report. It took the AI model 16 seconds, OK? And so this is where we can leverage AI for operational efficiency. We free up our 3D labs so now they can focus on more complex ta tasks. What about opportunistic screening? Big area for deep learning. The question is, can we add value to imaging that we're already providing? Can we affect population health in this era of value-based care? And can we use AI to do something that's not currently possible, either, again, because our eye is not trained to look at an image in a certain way, or there's just too much information on an image for us to be able to practically get through the day? So sticking to coronary calcification, we know patients undergo routine non-gated chest CTs all the time, and there's coronary calcification on those that might be prognostic of their future risks. But as studies have shown, radiologists do not commonly comment on this, and if they do, it's largely qualitative. And more importantly, these scans can be degraded by motion or because the dose differ, uh, differs from gated studies, the quantitation may not be accurate. So again, we decided to train a ResNex 50 model to quantitate and more accurately look at this on non-gated chest CTs. And you can see an example here. Uh, one of these is by the human. One of these is by the AI model. Again, qualitatively, they look the same. But again, now we can do something that wasn't possible before or the radiologist can now focus on the thoracic findings and not have to worry about these incidental findings that are still important as far as the progno prognosis for the patient. But if you ask me, this is the future, AI augmented decision support. This is where human-machine partnership can unlock the maximal diagnostic performance. So as an example, we trained a neural network for MRI of the knees, and to classify them either as normal abnormal, recognize ACL tears, and meniscal tears, you see the high AUCs there. But that's not where it stops. Here's the value add. We took non-musculoskeletal radiologists and orthopedic surgeons, gave them the knee MRI exams with and without AI assistance. And you can see in the green bars that the performance is better when they had AI assistance. To further study the human-machine partnership, we also looked at this concept of swarm AI. This is the idea that our brains have served as a design model for a lot of the artificially intelligent systems, i.e. neural networks. An equally uh, uh, depth approach is basically collective intelligence, known as swarm intelligence. This is the idea that multiple brains and multiple neurons work better than any individual alone. And if any of you know something about collective intelligence, it's actually modeled behind honeybees. Honeybees, basically, in order to find a new home, are going to send out scout bees over a 30 square mile radius. They then have to bring back home information about where we're going to move. And it's a life and death decision for them. So they do real time negotiations. The way they decide, as you can see in that video, is they do this little waggle dance. So how do we capture this in technology? So here's the platform. Uh, in this way, a group of users are connected. They're asked a question like, what is the best Netflix series? And they're going to try to move a puck with a magnet towards an answer. There's an AI engine that's looking at things like their ambivalence, strength of conviction, their confidence. And it's a constant feedback mechanism. On the back end, there's a behavioral neural network that's going to look at sentiment analysis. And hopefully, we come up with the most optimal decision. So we said, let's apply this to medical imaging. And in doing so, we took 50 chest radiographs for the diagnostic task of detecting pneumonia. We did a swarm session with 13 board-certified radiologists. And we wanted to compare radiologists versus the AI model, state-of-the-art at that time, and swarm. Again, swarm is where humans and machines work together. You can see an example of one of those sessions on the far right. So what were the results? First, there was no statistically significant difference between radiologists and AI. But when they worked together with swarm, that's when they outperformed each other. So the augmented model outperforms humans and AI alone. We've similarly done this in other fields. For example, this is a 3D convolutional neural network that we developed for cerebral aneurysm, where the AI model can actually paint areas that it thinks that there's a cerebral aneurysm. The radiologist then determines whether or not they believe that that's actually true. You can see here that all the radiologists, when they're augmented with the AI model, the blue dots, it's on the right of the unaugmented, which is the orange dots. Also note the wide variability in radiologist performances, which we'll talk about in the debate. 
Now, despite all this, there's still a lot of opportunities that exist. And again, I would argue that AI applications in body has a lag behind neuro and other specialties. So take a look at this from the literature. This is the number of publications over the last 10 years. And obviously, that's machine learning, traditional machine learning, but also deep learning. But body has lag behind. Body is represented GI and GU by the charcoal and the blue bar, far smaller bars than neuroimaging. And why might that be? Well, let's look at the appendix as an example of some of these challenges. We know that the appendix has a varied location. We know that we can't use size alone. Normal appendices can be seven millimeters, of course, or more. We have clinical history usually to help us out. And the biggest problem is lots of images. Class imbalance with the majority instance not being appendix, let alone appendicitis. So this is very difficult to train a deep learning model. And finally, other things happen, right? Patients may have widespread metastatic disease, or they may have primary appendiceal tumors. Sticking with appendix as an example, look at this single 2D image. Here's the appendix. Very little about that image is the appendix, right? There's very little signal to noise. It's not like a picture of a dog or cat where majority of those images are dogs or cats. So what do we do to diagnose appendix? We scroll through images, much like looking through a video. But even in this set of images, you can see that some of the slices contain both normal and abnormal appendix because this patient has tip appendicitis. But that's very confusing for a deep learning model to learn that. So we tried to see if we can improve some of this by using various techniques. So we trained a 3D convolutional neural network. We actually pre-trained it on labeled YouTube videos called kinetic videos. So here you see a father and son mowing a lawn, salsa dancing on the bottom. And when we employed this concept of transfer learning, our AUC jumped from 0.6 to 0.8. You can see the model. The heat map is focused directly on the area of appendicitis on the far right. When we look at modality-based publications, another area that's lagged behind is ultrasound. Ultrasound is in the orange bar, very far behind compared to CT and MRI. And the reasons are what we expect, right? This is a very operator-dependent and, and there's patient-level variation. This is a, a patient with, whose kidneys imaged twice, looks different. Liver's shattered out by bowel gas there. The most important one is biases. We had a model early on that was very accurate in detecting DVTs. If you have a model that performs very well, be cautiously optimistic. When we went back and did a sanity check, we determined that, in fact, the model wasn't paying attention to the clot. It was just using the calipers to make its prediction. Another bias is the number of images. What do our sonographers do when they see an abnormality? They take more images. So if we try to train a neural network on normal abnormal tasks, it'll figure out that, hey, if it's abnormal, the exam is going to have a lot more images, and it'll use that to make the prediction. So how do we solve that? What if we want to do normal abnormal triaging? We want to, of course, feed each individual slice into this 2D convolutional neural network. And at an exam level, we want to be able to say if it's normal or abnormal. So this is a case of multiple instance learning. If we look at this exam here, it's abnormal. But we know that majority of the images within this exam are not going to be abnormal, right? Majority of the images are going to be normal, and only a few are abnormal. And what multiple instance learning will say is, well, we're going to go through each of these images slice by slice. And if I see a single abnormal image, I'm going to give the entire exam, I'm going to make the entire exam abnormal. And that makes sense, because that's what we would want to do. The problem with this approach is if you misclassify a normal slice as abnormal, now you're going to suffer with your specificity. You're going to have high false positives. So what do you do? What you do is you put a two-layer convolutional neural network behind these probabilities. And now you use imaging embeddings, future embeddings, to make a better weighted uh, probability. And through some of these techniques, we're able to train another neural network, 1,500 renal ultrasound exams, binary task of normal, abnormal, triage and workflow optimization. We wanted to get over our caliber bias, class imbalance, uh, as well as this uh, sort of technique of multiple instance learning. And our AUC jumped from 0 0.61 and 0 0.84. And we hope that this will pave the way for additional uh, deep learning applications in ultrasound. So in conclusion, there's been a lot of work that's been done in AI and current applications exist. There's still a significant opportunity for AI and medical imaging. A lot of the challenges may be overcome by various modeling techniques and training approaches. And with that, I thank you for your attention.